hello and welcome to Making Mayo Make Sense. Uh, today we're going to put some pieces together and hopefully get it to where you have a solid understanding of how dentistry really aligns well with myofunctional therapy. So as I welcome you all in, uh, let me just get my slides together. There we go. As I welcome you all in, I just have to let you know why this even came about. Like, why are we talking about how Mayo fits into dentistry? Well, because it only makes sense to actually have this conversation. Um, I've been having a lot of conversations with a lot of you uh, more often now. People have been booking calls right and left. And so every time I wind up having a similar conversation whenever I'm talking to a dentist. It seems like nobody's ever explaining myofunctional therapy in a way that stops relating it to just airway or just sleep because not everybody's interested in that. A lot of bread and butter traditional dentistry has purpose for myofunctional therapy, but everybody is so caught up in like the mainstay noise of, okay, we're going to talk about how this fits in to sleep sleep and airway. Forget sleep, forget airway. We're going to talk about none of that tonight. We're going to talk exactly about how you can relate this into myofunctional therapy for traditional dentistry. Now, I have to start out by letting you guys know I am a smidgen off of my game, okay? Yesterday, a very, very sad day for me and my family. Um, unexpectedly, we lost our seven-year-old Esky Poo, Eskimo dog mixed with a poodle, Cassie. I feel myself kind of like getting riled up by it. Um, so I'm dedicating this in her honor. I think she would have wanted me to keep doing this. Every time I've been doing these lives, she'd be right under my desk at my feet. And so I'm really missing her right now. I'm I'm 100% dedicating this to her. And I would like to ensure that, you know, I make it through. And if I don't make it through, at least you know why. <laughs> at least you know why. So if I lose it, I start tearing up. You'll, you'll know why. Okay. So my beautiful girl, Cassie, may she rest in peace. Let's go forward. All right. All right, my own dentistry, and every single time, I mean, it seems like without fail, it's that my um, my streamyard will always throw off these slides. So, thank you for all of the sweet comments about my loss of. Um, oh my gosh, let me not talk about her anymore. She's. Oh, it hurts my heart. Um, okay, myo and dentistry and how it all comes together. So when we're looking at dentistry, there is a lot of correlation with how oral function impacts oral health. And I don't know why we're not talking about it enough. I know mouth breathing winds up being a lot of like what people talk about when they talk about airway, but we talk about mouth breathing as well in dentistry with relationship to dry mouth, um, to having sort of issues with our temporal mandibular joint because the increase of that freeway space is going to create an impact on the condyles positioning within the joint. And once that's compromised, now we have structural more implications that can happen, I should say, structurally, and then that's going to wear down the structure. And now we have issues there. We know that mouth breathing contributes to our salivary content and that microbiome and how we can have more of the anaerobic or anything really undesirable within that microbiome when there's more just natural air that's going through that oral passage. And we know the importance of the salivary microbiome, not just for gum disease and, you know, gingivitis, the buildup of plaque and so forth the buildup of plaque and so forth, we know that there is a very, very large connection there with gut health. So when we talk to some of our patients and they're telling us that they have irritable bowels, leaky gut, uh, constipation, diarrhea, those types of things, and it's not going well for them. And then we notice that they're mouth breathing and then we do nothing else to really put those pieces together for them. Maybe we refer them back to their GI or we say, okay, it could be something that's contributing your dry mouth with some of the medications that you're taking. But there's actually a really direct correlation 
uh, craniofacial development, very obviously, periodontal health, we are going to dive into. That is a big passion part of mine. Tonsil stones, because hello, the more that you are contributing to the biome of the mouth. So when you have all of that air passing through, a lot of times now you're drying out the mouth, you're changing the biome in a different way. You're catching more debris within the tonsils and then the tonsil stones are able to form a little bit more quicker. And we don't want any of that. So there's a large connection between functionally what the mouth is capable of doing to alter how systemic health will, will really manifest itself in the body, okay? But then there's also just within dentistry itself, because we know that we are really the people who are, should be looking at a lot of this thing, who's better than dentistry to identify abnormal oral function? Like, I'll wait, you give me a better profession that's going to be able to ab identify easily abnormal oral function. We spend a significant amount of time, tactile time, actually in the mouth, feeling, retracting, doing all sorts of things. You can feel an overdeveloped mentalis. You know when someone's masters are strong. You understand when there is oral dysfunction. Probably you'll feel it more so than you will consciously think about it, but you will feel it. No one's better to identify abnormal oral function more so than dentistry. Stabilizing the occlusal relationship. Hello, that is all of dentistry. That's a good part of dentistry. That's become now general dentistry with the help of clear aligners, right? Treating mouth breathing. Now we already done talked at the slide before about what exactly mouth breathing can do. And I think we all knew what all of that was too. But even better, parafunctional habits. And we don't talk about this enough. And what's interesting is that I've started putting it into lectures and things that I do. So I um, have a couple of speaking events that have passed and I have some that are coming up. So if you're coming to any of my speaking events coming up, you'll get a little peek of what's about to happen to you. But we're going to quiz, okay? We're going to do a little activity right now with parafunctional habits. I really want to know how many of you really remember what a parafunctional habit is is there are a lot of parafunctional habits, especially oral parafunctional habits. Can anybody in the comments give me a parafunctional habit? And I really wish I had some of that Jeopardy music right now. That would be really great because I could just do, 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 do with the little music. But in that, I've been live in rooms with people and I'm looking right at the crowd and I'm like, parafunctional habits and nobody wants to raise their hand. I'll give you a hint as to one of them. Please give me something in the comments. But um, I'll give you a hint as to one of them. Bruxism, clenching, grinding, parafunctional habits. Like these are adverse habits. There we go. We got one in the comments, grinding. There are a lot of parafunctional habits, clenching, grinding. Yeah, you guys got that one. Okay. Anything else? Can anybody give me anything else? There's a lot of parafunctional habits. And I think once you start really understanding what they are, you'll be like, oh, dentistry, like, duh, we're supposed to be remediating this stuff. Finger biting. Yes. Finger biting, finger sucking thumb sucking, nail biting. Yes. Adverse oral habits. Absolutely. Tongue sucking, object sucking, non-nutritive chewing. So all that chewing, if you're chewing on pencils, pens, mouth breathing is a parafunctional habit. Okay. A tongue thrust is a parafunctional habit. Lip licking, lip sucking, lip biting, all of these things are parafunctional habits, like things you shouldn't be doing with your mouth, but that you are doing anyway, parafunctional habit. And I don't see any one of these that look like they should be outside of the realm of dentistry because you know why? It directly correlates with our work area and has an impact on what happens within our work area specifically for plaque buildup, for the alteration of the saliva microbiome, it's going to have a big impact on what we're going to be seeing in our patient's mouth as we are looking at them, okay? So when you take a look at the full scope of parafunctional habits, and there's not a thing on here that myofunctional therapy does not cover, cannot address, okay? When you're looking at the full scope of parafunctional habits, I think it's really 
eye-opening as to what exactly this blend between myofunctional therapy and the world of myofunctional therapy and dentistry can really be. Because can you imagine when you are able to be more effective for your patient's daily habits by offering them a therapeutic modality that can actually facilitate the elimination and or the reduction, but elimination for most of these parafunctional habits, okay? Our lingual function primarily is what we deal with with myofunctional therapy. And when we're addressing the lingual function, I, I think it's important that we really sit back and we realize that our tongue has a lot of different ways that it can move and manipulate. So our tongue is able to cup. And so when our tongue is cupping, the anterior and lateral borders of the tongue are actually up and elevated. That cupping is actually really, really helpful for cleansing a lot of the palate. Oftentimes we'll see that that's used when people are eating. Suction, as you are done and you're eating, if you've had something that's really sticky, sometimes things that stick into your teeth, what's the very first response that you might have? I think some of you may have even heard other people do this. And so when you are at, let's say, a restaurant or some forth and you hear somebody sucking their teeth, just trying to pull something out of their teeth, suction is not just for oral rest posture. Our tongue and its agility is actually really helpful in being able to cleanse the oral palate or oral, uh, oral cavity in that way we can keep ourselves a little bit more clean. So our tongue is actually our body's like natural toothbrush, okay? It's the very first step. You have something stuck in your teeth. I don't know how many of you, your very first instinct is to reach for floss because instinctually we should actually be going at it with our tongues. Your tongues will probably get there before you ever get your hand in your pocket or your pocketbook for that floss that you may carry. Lateralization, we need to be able to lateral, lateral lateralize our tongue. I'm speaking too fast. We need to be able to lateralize our tongue. We have to be able to retract it if we're going to get things out from our cheeks. You ever had like food, especially soft food when you're eating something soft and it gets stuck like somewhere in your cheek there and you're just going at it and it's like, I can't get this thing out of my mouth. It's a lot of times we need that ability to get our tongue deep within the crevices behind the lips in the buccal surfaces to actually cleanse out. Elevation, a lot of times you get something stuck or some bit of your bolus, which is your pre preparation of food that is ready to be swallowed. You get that thing stuck on the roof of your mouth. How are you going to get it off? You just kind of pull it back down to you. Use the tip of your tongue to grab that and to get it. So a lot of the times when we are looking at our lingual function, our lingual function is actually our first line defense, okay, against any sort of food, debris, particles, bacteria, and it helps to prevent with the plaque buildup. In fact, most of the tongue's job is done in that aspect for oral cleansing, through the papilla of the tongue. So the papilla of the tongue is really what's doing that. So can you imagine if your patients have limited oral range of their tongue, so they can't get back to all those teeth, and then you are, I was going to use the word berating, but I hope nobody's berating their patients about having buildup in certain areas that seems very persistent. Sometimes it's not about their brushing habits. It could be one, their buckles are just too tight and they can't get open enough to get their brush back there or to facilitate getting back there and they haven't purchased the water floss or as of yet. Two, it could be their tongue is not adequately able to reach that space. And so they're never really getting to clean out there really well in between those brushing times, okay? Three, it could just be that they pocket food in a way that they shouldn't. And so they have abnormal use or oral dysfunction in the muscles of mastication. So they're unilaterally chewing or they're not rounding and so forth. So there's a lot of different reasons where oral function and exactly what it is that we do when we're talking about oral hygiene and oral health really come into play together in a way that we don't talk about enough. In fact, you will find that in a lot of the countries, and there's not very many now, a lot of the world has become very, you know, industrialized um, and they're exposed to a lot of different things. There's almost nowhere where they have not seen a toothbrush and they have not been able to really facilitate 
oral hygiene using more modern things, but in the areas in the societies where they use sea wax. So sea wax are the little pieces of the tree that they do, they splice up a little bit and then they can use it almost like a toothbrush to kind of cleanse their teeth. The sea wax, one, the materials that are within that sea wax, a lot of antimicrobial wonderful properties, it kind of coats the teeth, but those societies typically have a lower rate of periodontal disease and oddly enough, more oral function than a lot of the, you know, more industrialized societies where we are just really going about with, okay, the only way to do this is electric toothbrush, floss, and mouthwash. But the societies that have the sea whack, the very simple things and are orally cleansing, lower rates of periodontal disease. I mean, call me crazy, but it is absolutely true. And I've got a wonderful research article where I can point you to. I've got a one tab. I'll share it with you all at the end, I promise. Um, periodontal disease, let's get into perio. I've got some cases coming up, so don't go anywhere. I know you guys are like, oh, she said she was gonna share cases. First, I gotta drive home the point that myo and dentistry go together. Notice I haven't talked about anybody's airway, okay? At all, who cares? Leave that to the side for now, okay? Periodontal disease. A lot of times when we think about periodontal disease, we think about the biochemical contributors. So we'll talk until we're blue in the face, registered dental hygienist here, okay? I don't practice clinically anymore, but I promise you anytime that I did oral hygiene instructions all the time, I'm talking about brushing, flossing, how to take care of the teeth. I'm teaching, you know, floss threading. I'm doing the good work. Okay. So I get it. We're talking about the biochemical, the build up of the plaque, the build up of the calculus and how all of that is impacting and wearing down on the periodontium. But what we're not talking about to our patients is that bone responds directly to loading. Okay. And we know that because of the osteoblast and the osteoclast relationship. So when the bone on bone is hitting, clenching, grinding, or any sort of facilitating of really getting those jaws together in a non-purposeful way of getting the occlusion um, to actually contact, that's going to be a problem as far as our bone health. And that's going to actually contribute to more vertical bony defects. So when you see more horizontal uh, bony defects and so forth, where you're seeing that loss and it's more horizontal and it's consistent throughout, okay, we don't really have to have much of a conversation about the biomechanical and that's how everything is functioning. We don't have to have as much of a conversation about the biomechanical contribution because while there may be one, it's probably not as large as all of your patients who have the vertical bony defects, okay? Vertical bony defects, more common in those who have parafunctional habits where there is bone on bone contact or tooth to tooth contact, and it is really stimulating that osteoclast relationship. That's gonna cause more inflammation and irritation along the gingiva. That cervical gingiva now is more inflamed and that leaves a wonderful area of opportunity for our anaerobic bacteria to just sit down and settle in the space, okay? So now we're talking biochemical and biomechanical, where the function is actually contributing to the success of the chemical contribution. So can you imagine you do your non-surgical periodontal treatment, you can irrigate, you can, you know, do laser treatment, you can do this, that, and the other thing. You could do your surgical treatment, but you never do anything about that parafunctional habit. Have you addressed or stabilized in any way, shape, or form? I don't care how many times you have them come back for perio maintenance. Have you stabilized in any way, shape, or form their periodontal disease? Nope, because that biomechanical factor is still there. And that is the problem. That's why we need to be getting myofunctional therapy on board overall, because the rate of periodontal disease in America is sickening for a, a country that is so well developed, where we have so many instances of all of these wonderful tools everything expensive you can buy, you can get a $300 toothbrush, you can get yourself, you know, whitening, you can get disclosing solution in a store, you can go to a CVS and get disclosing solution. There's nothing that is not at your fingertips. And for some reason, we still have high rates of periodontal disease. 
Sure, we could talk about diet, but then we're still talking about biochemical. What about those who are experiencing parafunctional habits, those who are contributing by having adverse occlusal relationships? And I like to consider myself a bit of an expert in this topic. One, because I lecture on it, yes, of course, but two, because I also did a very comprehensive literature review in 2021 uh, where I went through a significant amount of research and articles trying to find everywhere that I could put together any sort of research that would really narrow down parafunctional habits of all sorts and types, tongue thrusting, uh, malocclusion, that's grinding, clenching, bruxism. I was putting together all of the things and all of these things out of that, we really got one large uniform finding. So the big finding for that is that if there's any chronically untreated dysfunction and dysfunctional use, I should say, of the muscles of mastication, that's going to perpetuate all of the clinical signs that you're seeing of periodontal disease. So we have a lot of patients who will come in and who will say, oh my gosh, I'm doing all the things. I bought the things. They may have purchased the things from your office and still they're not seeing any difference. I'm bought, I bought the things, I'm using the things, I've changed my diet. I don't know what else I can do. Well, we, we can probably do is start to address the dysfunction, the oral dysfunction that we knew you had all along and that we failed to address previously, okay? It's very important that we start to work together and collaboratively in advancing the way that we're treating some of these things because people really are seeking and searching for more alternative health choices, okay? 80% of the American population is going first to Dr. Google before they ever step foot into your office. And so by the time they've hit Dr. Google, they've probably fallen down a rabbit hole to the point where I would just say 80% of the conversations I have on a day-to-day -day basis with patients or potential patients, it's about something that their doctor hadn't even informed them about. It's about something that they found on Dr. Google and how myofunctional therapy can help them here, there, and everywhere, because guess what? As far as I know, all the myofunctional therapists that are worth their weight in gold are educating and are out there educating about this stuff. So periodontal disease, we have to talk about. We have to talk about the implications that it has uh, when we have dysfunction, oral dysfunction. We have to talk about mouth breathing. We have to talk about the lack of tongue range of motion to be able to cleanse the oral cavity. If we are giving oral hygiene instructions, we are at a great loss if we are not also accompanying, accompanying that, sorry, with oral function instructions, okay? And that comes through myofunctional therapy as your primary course of action. All right, so let's talk about myo and how it works. This patient that I had here, is a physical therapist, okay? I get all these interesting cases and I love working with these practitioners that are already well-versed in certain things, right? So physical therapists do get some education on TMD and how they can remediate things as far as manual therapeutic techniques, various exercises, and the exercises are typically limited to about three, maybe four types of exercises. Once you've exhausted that, you don't really have much else that you can do and that you can go to. So this is a physical therapist. And I always saw this physical therapist in their office, which is like the most interesting thing in the world. Um, our initial evaluation, I was surrounded by physical therapists that were just in shock and in awe of like, what's going on here? Like, how do you know all this stuff? Because it's oral dysfunction. That's it. I, as a registered dental hygienist, that's my jam, oral dysfunction. I can't expect physical therapists to know about oral dysfunction. I don't care how much they know about manual therapeutic techniques for TMD. There's something to be learned. So we had a very interesting talk about the background for this patient. So every day sleep was a big, big issue, but we're not here to talk about sleep. It's the TMD and the oral facial pain that were really big contributing factors to the lack of sleep and the issues with the joint and how it wouldn't really sit right. She never really felt like she could find her relationship, the occlusal relationship. So she found herself adjusting her jaw very often. So what would we do if we were in dentistry? 
in dentistry, more often than not, we might just adjust the occlusion in some way, shape, or form, uh, try to put her back in some sort of orthodontic, um, orthodontic treatment if that's what we find to be necessary. It's going to involve some sort of like, we're going to now address this in a particular way that's going to just work on what's going on with the teeth and not necessarily what's going on with the muscular function that's trying to keep you stable and steady. And so she had no idea what was stable. She had no idea what was steady. She had a lot of difficulty, honestly, with being able to identify why some of her pain would be occipital and then some of the pain would be along the ramus and the condyle. And so we we just did myofunctional therapy. I used the Manditract and I used my, myofunctional therapy. She was already a physical therapist. And so she was doing her own techniques um, for herself. And she had been doing that for a year and a half prior to us ever starting to work together. She had colleagues that worked on her and I talked to them on December 30th, 2022. Um, and we were all discussing how they had really tried to stabilize her to no real uh, of effect of their own. Uh, the tongue she thought was tied and she had difficulty getting that tongue to the back, to the molars. She did complain that she always had something going on on the molars when she was at her dentist's office. She switched a couple of dentists because she was tired of it being the same teeth. She felt like it was the dentist who was doing something wrong. Here's what was actually going on, okay? So her tongue, a little restricted, really borderline restrictive, okay? And so we wound up just getting through the myofunctional therapy program. She did not wind up getting any tongue tie release. She didn't want to, and she had really great functional range. Her lip seal was phenomenal. Her oral rest posture went phenomenal with just myofunctional therapy, and we used the Manditrack. Myofunctional therapy, Manditrack, about nine months of us working together, and I saw her every two weeks. So once every two weeks for nine months, if I saw her week to week, then you can condense that down to like four and a half months, but she needed more time in between as I find most people do. So about nine months long, we worked together and were able to get her to the point where at the end, she was like, I can't tell you the last time I didn't know where my teeth were. Like, I feel really solid. I feel really stable. I have really good um, identification of where my jaw is at rest and where my tongue is at rest. I feel like I sleep and breathe and live generally better as a result. And so myofunctional therapy actually wound up being the wonderful little trick. So I've actually seen her more recently for a check-in and a touch-in appointment. So we had two of those since I have completed her case and nothing, nothing when she went back to the dentist again. So no issues in those back molars where she was constantly chronically having issues. Hmm. Interesting. Very, very interesting. And I think that that's something that we should all put in the back of our mind, that our patients aren't like these crazy people sometimes who are just doing the same bad habits, not able to reach the areas that you want them to reach with their toothbrush, or they're just not flossing because they just don't care. Sometimes oral dysfunction is the biggest contributor to what's going on with some of their poor oral health when they show up in your office and your practice, okay? So myofunctional therapy works, okay? This is another physical therapist. I've worked with physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, like all sorts of people who wind up coming to me who are like, help, I don't know what's wrong. I've tried everything in my field and it's not helping because you need just a little bit more than what you've got in your field. So this one, another one, totally unrelated. They don't know each other. They don't even live in the same state. Um, these two, same thing, very similar background. However, this one, when she started, every single morning, she had to readjust her jaw. Nothing is in her mouth that causes the jaw to displace. So no oral appliance therapy. There's nothing in there that's really creating that issue. So always had to, uh, had to chronically readjust. At least once a week, experience some form of locked jaw, okay? At least once a week. This is a therapist who knows a lot of manual techniques, who has been doing a lot of manual techniques. Again, like the other one, they have colleagues come in. It's like, we know all the people. We're going to do all the things. We're going to do the last one actually did pelvic floor therapy, which I 100% praised her for. There's a lot that you can do to try to address some of this dysfunction. 
but that doesn't help get to the root of everything, which is our dental special area, okay? All back in here. And so when I was working with this one, myofunctional therapy, cranial nerve work, uh, we did a little bit of breath work um, and mostly Mandatrack, mostly Mandatrack myo cranial nerve work. Those three. At the end of working together over the nine months that we worked together, this one, she had the nerve to tell me that she doesn't remember telling me, and I have it on record, but she does not remember telling me that she had locked jaw once a week. She cannot remember the last time she had locked jaw. She's like, I believe you. I probably said it and I probably did experience it, but it's been so long since I've had it, since I've had that crippling, like, pain in the morning that I don't even remember that being the case. And I was floored, absolutely floored. This one was a really great case where there was an open bite. She had tongue tamers in on the back. The orthodontist had been struggling uh, like up a wall, all sorts of errors with sounds. Um, when she was thrusting, she had a frontal list. She had a therapist that was also working on the speech and so forth. We were working on multiple angles to get to this, to get to this. And this was actually a really, really, really great case because since then, we've also had touch and check-ins. And in those touch points, again, can't remember the last time any sort of TMJ sort of pain, discomfort, the open bite is closed. It was a complete anterior and uh, posterior open bite. So complete full open bite, a difficulty. We got the tongue tamers out day one. Okay. Tongue tamers contributed nothing to our success, all myofunctional therapy. So for her orthodontic case, for her TMD case, for her inability to really feel like she was able to get success through other therapies, we like knock down all the dominoes in these things. Myofunctional therapy can be really, really impactful for a lot of your patients who are struggling and suffering and who you might otherwise be like, oh, well, you're a physical therapist. Oh, okay, you're doing all of your things. Well, I could send you to a TMJ specialist and they could make you an appliance. That appliance wouldn't have helped her. She still had a lot going on with her dysfunctional occlusion. It wasn't even like she wasn't even in the occlusion, honestly, because she had that large open bite and the tongue tamers. And so the tongue would displace any of that. It was just absolutely absolutely not the case that you want to just kind of dismiss. And a lot of that was happening to her. And so myo and dentistry, it makes sense. There's a lot of different other things. And this slide, I, I like to use for a lot of different purposes, because it just goes through a lot of my different cases. Um, oh, I almost said her name here. And that's not right. And <laughs> she, she came to me and had a lot of difficulty with multiple orthodontic treatments and inability to really stabilize her occlusion. She felt like she could only chew on the one side and she couldn't really get herself fully functional. She had actually tried, um, this was her last line. She had tried seeing a specialist, a specialist sent her to a surgeon and said, okay, you're probably going to have to do a surgical route in order to really facilitate um, getting rid of this. I hope you guys can see my mouse. If you can't see my mouse, I'm on the farthest left. Um, well, I hope your view, it's your left, but it's the woman with the open bite. So we were able to decrease that open bite. So she got like within a millimeter or so of it actually being closed, closed all the way. She was going to follow up myofunctional therapy with doing, um, clear aligners again for like the third round with her orthodontist. The orthodontist wanted to make sure that she had finished myofunctional therapy first. Um, a lot of her functional issues completely like went away. She got more facial symmetry because she started chewing bilaterally and we had just better oral function. Um, we had a case in the middle there, um, it wound up being an ICR case. We didn't know that they, that the condylar resorption was happening. The idiopathic condylar resorption was happening when we first started. And, you know, it just didn't help. It did kind of 
countered just a little bit, but it didn't help. We had to take a pause. We came back after there was some surgical intervention and we got a lot of great progress in that case. I am very, very proud of that one too. Lip seal, lip strain, because you know that mouth breathing, mouth breather, the third one in it, really big mouth breathing and unable to really facilitate a lip seal at all. And then the lip seal, when it was achieved, was very, very strained. You could see the comfort with which there's that um, lack of strain in that bottom picture there. My favorite little girl, um, as far as patients go, because I have three daughters, so I, you know, whatever. Anyway, this little girl on the end, her mom had never seen her smile ever never seen her smile. And she was going into kindergarten and all the preschool pictures, like any picture mom took, you would get that smile that's kind of at the top where it's like a, it's not really a smile. She wasn't able to really pull back and pull up those cheeks and really facilitate, you know, being able to display her joy whenever she was really excited. And so mom had sent me this lovely picture. And then I took one too, while we were together. And I took several more as we worked together, but like, this was like the highlight of our, our time together. Yes. We had gotten a lot of other goals and a lot of things under wraps, a lot of carries, a lot of issues that she had in other areas, particularly with dental wise and dental concerns, but that smile, the ability to get the child to smile that was the one that made mom the full believer. She sings the praises of and does a lot of word of mouth referrals for the pediatric practitioner who referred her to myofunctional therapy. And that has helped that practice to grow. I'm telling you without a doubt, the integration of myofunctional therapy into a dental practice will 100% increase your word of mouth or organic referrals. If you are spending the 55 to 60% that some of the industry is spending, that's actually the industry average on new patient acquisition for your dental practice, that is problematic. You can reduce that by at least 20 to 30% and increase your word of mouth um, word of mouth referrals by 40% by simply integrating myofunctional therapy and doing nothing more. Uh, that's going to save you a ridiculous amount on overhead. I, I can't stress enough. Uh, we'll talk about crooked smiles a little bit. Crooked smiles. This was a two year case. Okay. So this case was very interesting. She came as a very shy, very nervous 14 year old, 14, 14 year old. I believe she was when we first started. So she was 14 years old when we began and she had this crooked smile that like it didn't matter who she went to, what she saw. She did physical therapy, occupational therapy. She saw a neurologist. Um, she had gotten all sorts of scans to see if there was muscle dysfunction there, like what's going on. She had done some stimulation work and nothing was really getting that lower lip to be even or symmetrical. Her dentist sent her to myofunctional therapy, said, eh, try myofunctional therapy. I had never met this dentist. I had never spoken to the dentist. He was like, go, go to this girl. She'll get you fixed up. And I'm telling you with the word of mouth referrals that her family does now, because out of the tens of thousands of dollars that they had spent over her lifetime trying to address this since she was about in kindergarten and never able to get any progress. The fraction of money that she spent, that not her, but her family spent on myofunctional therapy completely transformed everything. And that was a general dentistry practice that they were at. And it turned around that office too, as far as word of mouth referrals, because they were telling a friend who would tell a friend who would tell a friend and everybody who knew her and saw her final result was like, oh my God. So she's on, um, she's on social media and she is a wonderful influencer who's doing makeup and doing all sorts of stuff on social media. And I'm so, so proud of her and how wonderful she has become. And she's been able to really blossom because she was one of those people who might smile or laugh with the hand in front. That way you can't really see what's going on. And now she's bright, she's bold, she's in front of cameras and it is such a large wonderful joy for her. There was a lot of things that I found as far as oral dysfunction and, and so forth. The biggest issue here and why the dentist sent her when, you know, other things were attempted, were tried, and the tried and true methods didn't work was for that crooked smile. And so 
that's the big one for the highlight of that. I love sharing this case. This case, we didn't even finish myofunctional therapy, okay? Let me tell you about this case. I love this woman. She was uh, very eccentric and like just super wonderful to work with. Um, she had a lot of cosmetic work, chin implant, cheek implants, the left cheek implant had actually failed. Um, and so a lot of Botox, lip fillers, all sorts of things, right? For the time that we were working together, her main concern, I, I don't, she did not care what was going on. And let me go one slide ahead so you could see her whole mouth was restored, okay? So everything, all teeth, fully restored, everything all crowns everywhere. And I know some of you um, hygienists are probably enjoying these margins, these gingival margins and like the rolled bulbous margins there. Uh, but everything was restored. And not only that, open bite, both sides, okay? So not even the natural teeth and still we can't get a good occlusion. Um, so there was struggle there, but she didn't care about any of that, okay? All of that's inside her mouth, she doesn't care. People are going to see the outside. And she didn't like the asymmetry. She didn't like that she was not even. She hated that the philtrum was off, that she was not even. And so she's like, can myofunctional therapy help me get my face more even? And I said, probably. I don't know. <laughs> like myofunctional therapy, we have a lot of happy accidents. I will work with you. And I guarantee you that I will work the hardest I can to ensure you get those types of results if that's what you're looking for. Um, but it's really not why we're going to do myofunctional therapy. We're going to do myofunctional therapy because this is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. <laughs> and she's like, I don't care. Fix this. So even with all the cosmetic work and even with all of the uphill battle that we had with the fact that, you know, sometimes she just really didn't want to do those exercises. We only saw each other for about five, six visits. Um, I do a really good case overview where I talk about all of her exercises and so forth in my myopathway course uh, that we could really follow this case through of cosmetic dentistry and cosmetics. Like if you have a dental medical spa uh, and you're looking to give people these types of natural results, stop with the face yoga, stop with those stupid little apps. I get all these ads on Instagram. No, you can integrate that into your practice with myofunctional therapy. So we did about five, six sessions uh, with exercises targeting every single time I was giving her facial exercises in addition to the functional work I needed her to do with her tongue, her lips, her cheeks, uh, but facial exercises all the time. And after that, uh, we had gotten to a certain point where she's like, are you seeing any difference? And I'm like, yeah, let's take a picture. Let's do a before and after. I sent her the before and after. She's like, I'm good. I need a break from my functional therapy. I think I look great. And you know, I'll call you if this ever like falls apart. <laughs> I'm like, no we were doing so well. We were getting such great progress. Imagine what you would have looked like at the end if you went all the way through and imagine the stability and the retention if you went all the way through, because that is the biggest part. Like if you think about those cases I talked about earlier, where we're months and months out, I've gone years and years out. It, actually, the crooked smile case is years and years out, fully retained or new oral habits. We're talking about full neuromuscular um, repatterning and establishing new habits that are subconscious that they're able to retain and habituate. And so she would have gotten so much more. I would have loved to really see like the end end result. But for all the cosmetic work, you would never know that myofunctional therapy made the biggest difference in her facial appearance. You would never, ever know. Somebody would probably assume that that was all plastic surgery. Nope. It's a lot, but mostly Maya <laughs> at the end that made that big change and difference, okay? Okay, so a lot of information, a lot of cases, a lot of like, well, what am I supposed to do with all this information now? Like, how am I supposed to get this done? I don't I don't understand what you want me to do with this information, Carice. How do I get this into my practice? How do I really utilize this in a way that makes sense for me? Um, I'm going to tell you first things first, every time I've had this conversation so far. So this was spurred on by the fact that I have been having more conversations with doctors who would like to hear more about how it helps actual dentistry. I want to then say that secondarily, you need to know about scope. And it's so very interesting because I was watching a, a Instagram video uh, earlier with another 
very prominent myofunctional therapist uh, who is not in the dental specialty, who was talking about how myofunctional therapy is regulated. And I really just so badly wanted to be like, show me the legislation because there is no legislation. So when we're talking about scope, everybody's going to be like, oh, what's in your scope? Is it in our scope? Scope, 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 scope. It's not your dental scope. I'm going to tell you that and I will never say it ever again because like there's no reason to reiterate that point. It is not your dental scope. Can you become a yoga practitioner? Yes. Can you do energy work? Yes. Can you go back to school and become a licensed massage therapy? Yes. A licensed massage therapist. Sorry. Yes. Would you ever go to your dental board and be like, hey, so I've got this education in massage now. Is this in my scope? No, you never would. You wouldn't because that doesn't make sense. You know, it's not in your scope. When you're practicing clinical dentistry, stick to what is in your dental state practice act. When you are practicing anything else, like stick to the bubble of the rules that are as they are there. Because let me tell you something. If you think it's ever going to fall into scope, you got a whole nother thing coming. Because as far as I'm concerned, and y'all are going to find this to be very controversial, but myofunctional therapy is about the most imaginary field there is, okay? And you can go run tell that and tell anybody that you want that I said it was imaginary and that it's made up. There are no rules. There is no regulations. There are no accrediting boards. It is not registered as an accrediting board with a body that regulates it by the Department of Education. It does not exist it is imaginary. There's no standardization. How I do my program might be different from how you do your program, which might be different from how Susie, Jane, and anybody else does their program, okay? There's nothing that keeps any two programs alike, which thereby makes it almost impossible to research, which therefore, with the number of educational institutes, makes it even more and more and more difficult to regulate what the teaching standards are and what the certifications should be and what this and that and that. So it's all made up, okay? So if anybody's trying to guide you and they're telling you that you have to do this or it's regulated and you need to do that, and you have to make sure that you're certified because if you're not certified, then when this becomes a thing, it's imaginary, okay? Somebody done did made it up. And by the time they are finished with whatever they put together for this imaginary thing, it's already evolved into something else entirely. And so I don't think, I don't think, this is my personal opinion after doing a lot of research, speaking to a lot of lawyers, I'm in the middle of a lot of different legislation to try to establish that separation and segregation between dentistry and myofunctional therapy. It is never going to be a standardized thing. So if you are holding certification over your head, it's like, well, what if, what if unicorns came flying out of the sky? It's the same thing, okay? Myofunctional therapy, very imaginary. Okay. That does not negate the fact that we have a lot of different methods and ways of achieving results for patients. That does not negate the fact that when you have a process that works, and that's the problem for dentistry, is that nobody has found the way to really make the process work. So a lot of times I'm talking to people and they're like, I've talked to this person and I've talked to that person and they didn't have it work in their practice. Did they have somebody come and actually walk them through how to put it in their workflow? Did they have the education where instead of just having the practical, okay, this is what you do, they actually had somebody come and do it with them. So here's what I mean by that. If I hand you an instrument, hygienist or dentist, if I hand you an instrument and I say, this is a such and such curette, and here's how you use it. You're going to go on this tooth and then you're going to have this rock and roll motion and you're going to make sure that your wrist stays straight and I want you to full crumb and da, 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 and I show you and you are there on the tooth and you're doing it. How much of a difference does that make than if I tell you, I get a book and I say, here, this is a picture of such and such instrument. You use it this way, such and such a degree angle. Make sure you don't hurt your wrist. Ergonomics is important. How do you implement that? How do you implement that? We are tactile individuals. So you're signing up for courses because Joe Schmo told you that this course is the best course to take because you need XYZ certification for this imaginary field. And then you go into that course. Not only do you not have any clinical experience, you've never been told how to implement it into your practice to make it make sense. 
So yes, dental professionals are losing their investment in myofunctional therapy at three times the rate. And we are actually contributing to the detriment of the field because we're not executing with excellence. So I don't do that no more. Okay. I don't do that anymore. I have left the chat that has any sort of Im impact on just giving out information. I don't give out information. I mean, granted, that's what we're doing here, right? I'm giving you information. But when it comes to education, I want to be there with you to help you implement. I guarantee you six figures, six figures in myofunctional therapy in a dental practice when implemented using the systems that I custom work to your workflow. If you are not making six figures, I will happily hand you over all of the money that or that was paid out to me. But I guarantee you, you'll make that investment within the first month, if not within the very first week of your myofunctional therapy uh, implementation and program. So let's chat. Let's chat. Let's work it out. Uh, this thing does not have to be imaginary and detrimental. It can be very, very real, like it is for all of my patients, all the people I work for, all the practices that refer, all the ones that I refer out to, all the people who I have helped to increase their revenue, to increase their organic marketing, to decrease their overhead. You can get this to happen. It can work. You just have to make the system make sense, okay? Everybody's still with me. Let me know if you're with me in the chat. Um, this is a link that you can use so that you can chat with me to schedule a chat. That way we can talk and we can determine how myofunctional therapy can best fit into your practice, your lifestyle, and you know how it is that you are going to be seen and show up in the field. Now, um, I want to give you guys the, let's show that. There you go. The bit.ly. I have some research that goes along with all the parafunctional and the perio and whatever stuff that I was talking to you about. There's some research that I've compiled in a one tab. So it is bit.ly, so B-I-T period L-Y backslash 3T, capital T, lowercase Y-S-H-J-O, okay? That's O as an octopus, not zero. It's an O, okay? This bit.ly is going to be great for you, and um, it's going to help put everything together, okay? So let me take that off now because I've got a question, and I really want to get to it. Can I go back and explain what Amanda Track is? Amanda Track, M-A-N-D-I, capital T-R-A-C, is now sold by um, Dynaflex. Dynaflex has the Amanda Track now. So let me take down this. That way you could see me and hopefully it'll come back to me. There we go. Yay. Hey. Okay. So Mandatrack, wonderful little appliance. Looks like this. It's got a handle. Okay. And it's got two little rollers, the two rollers on it. Phenomenal. I use this for all my TMD, any sort of jaw cases. Um, this you can get from Dynaflex. Dynaflex sells these, and I believe it's $32 and change per one. But this is a game changer, and all the physical therapists and occupational therapists are actually really, really big on using this one. Somebody asked again about the bit.ly. Let me put that back up. That way you can see that. And there's three different exercises you can do with this. One is a biting exercise, and then two are rolling exercises where you roll it, where you place it is going to impact the muscles that it works on, how you use it matters. I would highly recommend you go and you look into the Manda track if you are a myofunctional therapist. And even if you're not, Dental Sleep Practice had a really great article about how the Manda track has been really impactful in just general cases in helping people to improve their oral facial function, um, just using the Mandatrack alone. I think Mandatrack is best used with myofunctional therapy as one big collaborative effort, but absolutely, Mandatrack is a phenomenal device. Like I highly recommend it and I use it almost every, every day. I hope you got that bit.ly. Um, for those of you who did not get my bit.ly for a chat, use it. Okay. If you are not where you want to be with myofunctional therapy, I'm happy to chat with you about the many different options and the many different ways that you can get to where you want to be. 
But I am so proud of myself for making it through this without crying or having like an emotional moment. And I'd like to think that Cassie would be proud of me too. For those of you who maybe jumped on late, you know, that's my my dog. She passed yesterday unexpectedly and we are uh, very, very sad as a family. So thank you for being with me here tonight. It was a very, very tough one for me to make it through, but I'm so proud of myself and I am so proud of all of you. And I think if you're not where you want to be, you are on your way there just by showing up here. Your actions do matter. Okay, guys. Let me know if you have any other questions in the comment. I'm going to pop over into all the different places in the Mayo spot, in the Mayo community, sorry, the Mayo spot YouTube, and I'll be on LinkedIn and I'm going to check. All right. Everybody have a really great evening. Thanks. Bye.